name. Number two in your hymn book. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. This is number two in our hymn books. We're going to go right to that last stanza, number four. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to His name. Excellent singing. Please be seated. Come on up here, youngins. Let's sing a song. We're going to sing. We're going to sing deep, deep, deep as the sea. I don't think we've sung this one like forever. Real simple song. Deep. Go to go go deep. Where's the sea? It's deep, deep, deep as the sea, and then high, high, high as the sky, and wide, wide, wide as the ocean blue. Okay, y'all got that? So sea, and sky, and ocean. All right. We all good? Don't smack your neighbor. Don't, just don't do it, all right? <laughs> deep, deep, deep as the sea, high, high, high as the sky, wide, wide, wide as the ocean blue is Jesus' love for me and you. It's just as deep, deep, deep as the sea, high, high, high as the sky, Wide, wide, wide as the ocean blue is Jesus' love for you. Oh, beautiful singing. I have not heard anything like that in such a long time. Spectacular, magnificent. Hey, Grayson, give me five there. Okay, two and a half maybe. All right, there we go. All right. Thank you, Grayson. Oh, I love that song. We got a new outline for Sunday school this morning. If uh, Brother Andrew, if you wouldn't mind, sir, we are in ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, and uh, we're starting a new section today in reference to the purpose of the church. I phoned just the other day with uh, Brother Tony, he called from Texas, say hey. They were just up in Wisconsin visiting family, which is always a blessing. Grandpa got to see the new baby when he was thrilled. And uh, so we were talking about uh, ecclesiology. He's been enjoying the, uh, the lessons. So he says, what are you teaching this weekend? I said, well, I think I'm going to preach on the purpose of the church. And so he was thrilled about that. So hopefully Brother Tony's listening this morning and or I guess catching up on videos. You know, we're a YouTube sensation. You all know that, right? Just, just filling you in. And... Uh, but uh, we're talking about ecclesiology, doctrine of the church. We've, uh, last, uh, what, four weeks, been talking about the, uh, um, the nature of the church. We talked about you know, the fact that it's like a bride, and it's like a uh, uh, pillar and ground of truth. And we also spoke about the fact that the uh, candlestick, that was a couple weeks ago. I appreciate Brother Sean teaching last Sunday. I enjoyed the Sunday school lesson, Brother. I didn't know, you didn't know that I was listening in, but I was, and that was uh, very enjoyable. Made some excellent points, I enjoyed thoroughly. I'm not sure who, uh, I think Tom sang last week. I forgot all about uh, the opening stuff, and usually I got my brother Covert to take care of that. I woke up Sunday morning, it's like, I don't know, probably close to 9 o'clock, and I'm like, oh man, I never asked anybody. So uh, my, my go-to is like, you know, Tom, just take care of it, man. So uh, did he sing with the kids last week? Yeah. Was it? What would you sing? Where's Tom at? Is he here? He's hanging around somewhere. All right. He's actually downstairs with the kids. With the kids? Oh, okay. So I don't even know. What'd you sing last week with the kids? 
you remember? Um, was, there, was there hand motions involved? Oh, oh okay, there's got to be hand motions. Yeah. Yeah, you can't sing without hand motions. Yeah, that one. Oh, angels bow before and heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Yeah, okay, that's all. Oh, that's, hey, I had motion enough. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you cover. I was like, talking about last minute. Yeah, oh, Tom, by the way. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, well, that's an incentive, right? All right. Um, I would invite your attention to uh, Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. And we're talking about the purpose of the church. It's going to be a couple weeks um, with this particular section. And um, uh, we're going to start with Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, the last two verses of that uh, particular chapter. And we'll have uh, we'll read these two verses and have a word of prayer and get started with our Sunday school lesson this morning. Uh, it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus, excuse me, by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let's pray. Father, just want to thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be able to get together in your house this morning. Uh, Lord, this weather has been um, pretty nasty these last few days. I just want to thank you. We have a dry place to meet and a good opportunity to have fellowship together as a body of believers and focus upon you, your son, the Lord Jesus, and your word. Uh, I do pray, Father, that uh, you'd minister to us today, help us to understand uh, what our purpose is here at New Testament Baptist Church, and that you would receive glory in your church. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Glory in the church. And so that's one of the first purposes, of course, uh, of, the, of the work of the ministry, the church here, and that is to bring glory uh, to God. That's the purpose of each one of the Lord's churches that has ever existed. Uh, and the first thing we're going to talk about is, is glory. Uh, glory, uh, by definition, uh, to give glory is to express an opinion of the magnificence of someone or something. That's what glory is. It's, to, it's an expression of an opinion concerning something. This is like, for instance, uh, uh, you know, maybe you're outside. It's a beautiful evening. It's a beautiful sunset uh, that's happening. You go out and you say, man, this, what a glorious sunset. And there's nothing wrong with using that word to talk about things because you're expressing your, your opinion, an opinion about the magnitude of something. When Joyce and I were away last week, uh, of course, um, the, uh, the equinox took place and the first, uh, the first day of fall, we were down at Ocean City, uh, went down to the boardwalk, I got there at, I don't know, 6.30, 6 something and others, sun rises. I forget what time sunrise was. There was just a few folks down there. And so we got to watch the sunrise on the first day of autumn. And it was pretty, and the sun came up and just lit the whole sky up. I got a few pictures. I might have posted a few. I'm not sure if I did or not. But uh, it was just gorgeous. It was glorious. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with using that term because that what we're, that's what we're talking about. We're identifying the magnitude of something. And so, but when it comes to God, we are expressing glory to Him and giving glory to God. So we're expressing the magnitude of what God is. And so that is part of, and one of the primary purposes of the church. And that is that we center our attention around God and understand how great God is. Now, uh, certainly that has a lot to do with some of the things that we'll be talking about even towards the end of that, and that is teaching and, and such as that, because, you know, we really don't appreciate the magnitude of what God is unless we're actually instructed and taught about some of those things. Um, but truly, the, the fact of, of the matter is somebody who has truly been born again by the grace of God, you begin to understand the magnitude of the glorious things about God, especially when He forgives you your sins. You feel that weight of sins uh, removed from your life in the moment that you got saved and the change that takes place immediately. And, and those, those things that happen to us when God begins to, uh, begins to come into our lives and begins to really shuffle things around, changes our attitudes about things. Uh, I know after I got saved, there's a lot of things in my life that changed immediately. And it's not because I had instruction about it or somebody gave me a list of stuff of do's and don'ts. 
It's just a, when the Holy Spirit gets in and all of a sudden changes your attitude and perspective about so much, you begin to understand how great God truly is. It's a glorious thing. And, and so what we do as a church is to promote um, the magnitude of God amongst our membership. And of course, outside of our membership, we want to introduce others to how great God is. But, you know, what we do together is we lift up Jesus Christ. We honor God and we begin to show um, folks within our ministry just how wonderful and great God is. God receives glory in His church. So it's not just a matter of saying, well, we glorify God. Well, what do you do? Well, we sing great hymns and, and uh, we have a prayer meeting. And You know, it's not a matter of functionality. It's not a matter of what we do physically to promote the glory of God. It, is a, it's a, it's a, it centers around His person, who He is, and not just simply what we do. Because what we do, what, what churches do, maybe are churchy, but maybe they don't glorify God. So to glorify God is truly that recognition of His person and, and what He is able, able and capable of doing. And so um, wanna, we're going to talk a little bit about this, but um, uh, please notice I have an outline here, and so please, if you'd follow along with me, uh, we'll start there in Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. And um, I, I want to... This particular verse, it says, if you're there, Isaiah chapter 41, um, do I get the right verse? That's weird because my notes say 42.8 and my outline says 41.8. So hopefully it's, it's probably 42.8. I, I do beg your part. Is it 42.8? Go to Isaiah chapter 42, verse number 8, and please correct your outlines, okay? This is our first correction of our outline this morning and certainly not our last, okay? I love typos. They just make me feel human. And um, Isaiah chapter 42 and verse number 8. Is that the right one, Brother Stephen? Could you read it? Sure. Thank you. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. All righty. We're going to be talking a little bit more about this in the morning service. We're going to be talking about the fact that God is wants us to uh, recognize only one God. We're going to be speaking about that in our morning service. But please notice here that the, the, you know, the ministry has to be all about God and, and nothing else. No one else, as he says here in this particular verse, I will give, not give my glory to another. And so, um, so we're talking about God not sharing this magnificence with anyone or anything else. And so I, I suppose it's very possible that any church could fall into the trap of extending glory to someone or something else. Um, certainly, uh, many ministries will revolve around individuals, maybe a pastor, um, a lot of larger, um, not even just denominations, but larger groups of churches often center around person or personality driven. Let's just put it that way. And so all of a sudden, the glory is being shared with another because this person is the primary source of the you know, excitement or advancement of a particular ministry or group of churches. Uh, it, it certainly can happen in, in, even in, in an individual church where you have a particular pastor that um, very charismatic and very driven, and that's what that church really is about. It's about this one individual. So there is a danger, of course, of sharing the glory because all of a sudden it's not about God, it's about a person. So God does not want to share His glory. Our responsibility as a church is to make sure the focus is upon God and not upon any other individual, not upon uh, any particular um, um, you know, way of thinking or, or, or uh, you know, maybe the latest publications that are out there. It's you know, kind of driven by popular trends, and all of a sudden, it's, it's all, the glory is extended to like a methodology instead of to an individual, which would be God. And so we have to be careful about that. It's not, it's not about any other individual. Matter of fact, uh, you know, it's not even about ourselves. Let's just be honest, uh, because, um, you know, a lot of churches are, um, um, uh, they, there were several, I've known several churches over the years that have had 
uh, particular ministries. Let's just so, throw it out there because I, I know a church that was like this. They had a Christian school and um, everything about the ministry was driven by trying to keep the school open. And, and so all of a sudden, the ministry was not about God anymore. The ministry was about the ministry. And so it all centered around trying to maintain a particular ministry. Um, I'll be throw another one out there for you because I've seen this play through. Um, you know, there's some churches that have been around for quite a long time. They've got this uh, building that was built by, you know, their, you know, great grandpa uh, back in the 1800s. And we've got this building and we've got to keep it going. We've got to keep it maintained. We've got to, you know, maintain our heritage. And the ministry becomes all about keeping a building open. And so the, the, it's centered on the function of keeping a building instead of promoting the gospel. And, and so you, we have to be so careful uh, about making sure we understand what the center is. The center is Christ. It's the, it, it, to understand the magnificence of God and not just push a, a ministry going. Um, you know, it's often been used, that term is often used about the tail wagging the dog. And a lot of ministries end up that way when the promotion is just making sure that this particular ministry continues. And it could be any number of things. Uh, you know, publishing ministry or, uh, uh, you know, um, maybe they, they distribute uh, uh, literature to somewhere. we got to keep this ministry going. And, you know, certainly ministries are important. I understand that. But once we lose focus on what the center of the church is about, it is all about God and His magnificence and not our ability of maintaining either a building or a particular ministry. It is all about the Lord. So God says, I'm not going to share my glory with any. And so once our, magnif our understanding of something's um, importance or magnificence is shifted away from God to something else. Um, you don't, like I said, God doesn't share. So he's like, fine, if that's what you want, that's what you get. I'll just wait over here till you're done. And then we'll get back to what we're supposed to do. So we have to be careful about not sharing this glory with anything else. Um, I would invite your attention to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Um, I've known a couple churches that have gone through that thing with Christian schools. I know uh, there was a church in particular uh, that struggled with that for years. They had a great school, but they, um, they struggled to keep that school going um, for, for many years. Um, that church is not even in existence anymore. Um, they, um, they, um, they, all right, they put so much money into the advancement of the school and went into so much debt um, they couldn't keep the building open anymore. They eventually had to sell it. I think a Pentecostal group eventually bought it. And uh, that church uh, was, uh, was, a good, it was, a, it was an excellent ministry. They helped our church out in Delaware quite a bit, going back to the you know, 80s. And um, you know, that, church is, that church is, does not exist anymore because they lost their focus. Yes, sir? Yeah. 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 Well, you know the. There's nothing wrong with having the ministries. It's just when they become the most important part of the ministry, then uh, I believe you rob God of the glory He deserves, because the it, the focus is all on maintaining a ministry instead of lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, any, any, any church is in danger of that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, placing blame for any particular thing. I'm just, I just observing the realities of it. I've seen it play through on occasions. And uh, I know there are, are, you know, especially with the building thing. I mean, I've, I've, oh man, it's just amazing what people fight over, <laughs> you know. And um, because the building comes, uh, oh my, okay, let me, let me just tell some stories now. Um, there was uh, our home church out in, uh, out in uh, Missouri. Um, 
you know, they got a new pastor. Of course, Brother Gray retired. Brother Jeff Abels got in there. He was making some changes. People got upset over the stupidest things, you know. He, 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 took this, he, he replaced the sign out front of the church. Replaced the sign out front of the church, okay. And I know they, they lost folks from the church because of that, because their, their father had helped put that sign up back in the 70s, and I can't believe you'd want to take that sign down and put something new up there. Give me a break. <laughs> um, stupid things. That is stupid. All right. I, I shouldn't be saying that from the pulpit. Actually, I'm at a podium, so it's okay. All right. It's just, it's just really dumb because where's the glory? Where's the glory? And um, uh, people just get so bent out of shape over the, uh, some of the... Anyway, it, because the focus is on the, on the building, it's on the structure... It's on, uh, it's on material things, and it's just not on God anymore when, when, you, start, when you start thinking like that. And, uh, and it happens all the time, and, you know, churches that, uh, you know, in our area, we have church properties that date back a couple hundred years around here. There's a long heritage of Baptist churches here in, in South Jersey that go back to the 1700s, and, uh, and you can get so wrapped up in the structure itself. I'm talking about the building itself, the structure itself, and just forget all about why we're here in the ministry anyway. And, um, you know, if we didn't even have a building, we'd still be a church, right? So it's not the building. And, and uh, you know, if God blesses us with something, amen. And, uh, you know, if we tear this building down and put something else up, it doesn't change our ministry one bit, you know. Um, just gives us, gives us more debt and less things to have to fix, I guess. I don't know. But uh, the, the point of it is, is that um, we... Um, Often what happens is when we get our eyes off of the glory of God and start getting our eyes on the material things or on individuals, as I started talking about people, um, God is, all, all of a sudden God is now sharing glory, and he just doesn't do that. And so, I, I mean, the way my view of that is, he just kind of like take his hands off and said, all right, as soon as you guys work this out, we can get started again, because he's not going to share his glory with anyone else. All right, um, Matt, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 18 uh, through, um, through 21. Let me get over there. So you know, these, these particular verses I'm, I'm looking at, I was just going through looking at some verses uh, concerning the glory of God and, and where glory comes from. And um, this particular section here is talking about the ministry. Now, this is an epistle. It's written to a group of Jews. I understand that. Um, um, we don't know the authors, likely the Apostle Paul, which I'm fine with that. And it's, it is directed towards a group of people. Paul, uh, the author is writing saying, hey, I'm planning on, I'm planning on coming your way. And um, I want to I come back to that. I wanna, I, he says in verse number 18, he says, pray for us, um, that we, uh, for we trust we, um, we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. But I beseech you, rather do this, that I may be restored to you uh, the sooner. Um, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so Christ is the one who is receiving glory, and Christ receives glory. In this particular verse, what it's talking about, the fact is, is God is working through us, through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when this, this is happening, God is, God is receiving glory. Uh, and so, you know, what, what this is reminding us of is the fact that the work of the ministry really has to be driven by the power of God, through the Holy Spirit, and, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to be, uh, be God-centered work of the ministry. Um, what, what, what happens, and as we talked about already, some ministries are, are you know, like individual or people-centered. Um, uh, um, is, you know, is it possible to do the work of the ministry in your own power, and, and in, by your own schemes, is that possible? And, and you know, the answer to that is emphatically yes. 
Matter of fact, you know, after the rapture takes place and we're all gone and the Holy Spirit is gone out of this earth, um, there's still a lot of churches that are going to be in operation and they're not going to miss a beat because it's not the work of God. They're not doing anything driven by God. It's all man-driven. It's all philosophy-driven. It's all, you know, self-power. It's all, you know, contrived in their own minds about how to do stuff. And, um, but, you know, that's not how we do the work of the ministry. I, you know, I love it. When, when folks are beginning to come to grips with the fact, you know, especially new believers, they come to grips with the fact that God is burdening them to do stuff and they feel extremely overwhelmed by that because they understand, I can't do this. Boy, that's the best place for anyone to be is when they realize they can't do the work of the ministry. That's a great place to be. And uh, Sister Rachel, I was, we were just talking right before the services. You know, I used to lead singing at our old church back in Delaware. And, uh, oh, I hated that. I felt so inadequate. I stumbled and messed up so many times, you know. You know, Tom, when you're, re you're singing the wrong verse and everyone's singing like verse 2 and you're on verse 3, oh, I just love that, especially when, no, when you don't realize until you're halfway through the verse, you know, and everybody's looking at you going, what, what, what's going on here? And you're like, Aah. and then you realize it and you feel like an idiot. It's just great. It's so humbling, you know. <laughs> And, um, you know, and so, you know, when, when, when you're in the midst of that kind of stuff uh, or you get an opportunity to preach and you're stumbling and stammering around and, and you know, I remember the first time I preached on a Sunday morning at, at the Bible Baptist Church in Claymont, Delaware. I got up that morning and I just threw my breakfast up all over the bathroom floor, you know. I was, I was so, I was like, ah! I was so nervous. I was a mess. Yes, I did puke. That first Sunday, I had a chance to preach. It's a good thing I did it at home and not at church, all right? Because I was just I was so overwhelmed. And, um, you know, when you, you just make so many mistakes and do so many dumb things, and, and God is so gracious. And, and, uh, and, and then when you realize there is no possible way that I can do this, and that is a great place to be. Because, you know, the shame of it is there's so many people that are in the ministry that have so much self-confidence. And, you know, when, you, when they think, oh, I, I can do that. It's just not a problem. I've, you know, oh, I've done that so many times before. It's not a problem at all. And then you realize that, um, you know, um, are, are, is, is sharing God's glory, is that what you're doing? God does not share his glory. And if he's going to get glorified in the work of the ministry, it's, he's going to get glorified because Christ is going to be working through you. And um, that whole idea of emptying ourselves and allowing God to work through us, that's a real thing. And uh, that's something that we have to come to grips. You can't imagine, um, you know, how long I've been here, 26 years? I still get so incredibly nervous every time I come to the pulpit. And I'm not, I'm not saying that to, you know, look how humble I am. I just, I don't, it is, it is humbling for me. Uh, you know, this past year, Joyce and I have had an opportunity to go and do a couple VBSs. And I, I love, that's something I've always enjoyed doing. And uh, you could ask my dear wife, I am a mess when I travel to other churches. I am a mess. And um, I, I just, I feel so inadequate. And Joyce is always like, oh, you're going to be fine. You get the first nine. Kids are going to love you. I'm like, yeah, I know, but I just feel I'm a wreck. Um, I hope that never changes. I really do. Um, God receives glory when we do the work of the ministry through Jesus Christ. And if it happens any other way, he gets no glory. And, and, and God wants to get glory in his church um, I, I have that verse of scripture in Isaiah chapter 6 written down there, which is, uh, of course, what a tremendous, I think I got that reference right, Isaiah chapter 6. Um, of course, um, Isaiah is um, seeing that tremendous vision there in heaven, sees the Lord high and lifted up. And um, I have verse number 3 in particular, and it says... Uh, and he's seeing the angels, of course, around the throne and one crying to another. Um, 
Let me see. I just have verse number three. I want to go back. I, I, do, I do beg your pardon. We'll start at the beginning there in verse number one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Twain covered his face. With Twain covered his feet. With Twain did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. And, of course, then Isaiah said, Ah, woe is me, for I am undone. And we see this, this glory of God. And, you know, it's, it's a vision, certainly, but it's a vision that Isaiah saw of the throne room of God. But the idea here, of course, is, is when the Lord is, is high and lifted up, when He becomes the center or the most important thing in the work of the ministry, then there is glory to be had because, because you know, it, it is all about God. And um, it, it's not about methodology. It's not about self-promotion. Uh, we don't, you know, here in our ministry, you know, there's a lot of folks who do a lot of things here, and I, you know, I, I try to do my very best of making sure that, you know, I recognize when when folks are doing some wonderful things, and and we do that. So I'm I'm not saying that we don't, you know, rec talk about individuals in the work of the ministry. So I, I mean, I greatly appreciate everything that everyone does, but you know, it is about the Lord. It, it's not about self promotion. Um, you know, you want to talk about your accomplishments, you go right ahead. But, you know, you think, are you robbing glory from God? And um, this is not what we do here at New Testament Baptist Church, and we shouldn't do. It is not about individuals and what we're able to accomplish. And if we are able to accomplish anything, uh, it's because God is working in us. And, you know, if, if God is going to work in us and we're going to lift Him up, you know, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all the men to me. And so, you know, that's, that's talking about evangelism. That's talking about outreach. We don't lift up ourselves. We don't lift up our church, you know. Well, we got this great ministry, and you'll just love it here. And, you know, we have so many things to offer. Uh, you know the greatest thing we have to offer? Jesus Christ, period. Anything else is just so minute as compared to talking about Jesus. And if we'll lift up Christ... Um, then God will get glory. And that's what the ministry is about. It's about lifting up Christ. That's, what, that's the primary purpose of the New Testament Baptist Church is to bring glory to God. Everything else is secondary. You know, we're going to talk about evangelism. You think, well, that's, that's the most important thing. Well, it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that God receives glory. And if we, if we lose sight of that, then anything else just falls away. We can do all the rest of the stuff but if God's not getting glory, then, then why are we doing it? So, you know, the next thing I said, bring the gospel to the lost. And, and I have, uh, please go to Matthew chapter 28. Of course, the Great Commission uh, that's mentioned there, Matthew chapter 28. Um, uh, I, when I wrote this outline, I said to bring the gospel to the lost, okay? We, are, we don't bring people to Jesus, okay? This is kind of those terms that really bother me, all right? So, I, yeah, I know in the Bible you see people in the Gospels bringing, physically bringing people to Jesus Christ. Yes, I know that, okay? And um, so what we do is bring the Gospel to the lost so that they will come and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Matthew chapter 28 is the Great Commission. And, of course, the commission's found in all the Gospels. Uh, Matthew 28 is just a great example of that. It's the most clearest statement. Uh, beginning, I have uh, the beginning of verse number 16, the 11 disciples went away into Galilee. And I always start there because I just want to remind all of us that this is the Lord's church. This is the 11 apostles that were left. This is Christ's church that he's commissioning. I always start in verse number 16. Get the context, right? Uh, they were in a mountain there in Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them, and he saw them. They worshiped him, uh, but some doubt it. Well, that'll make some good preaching right there. Um, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Let's stop right there. Um, that, uh, that term, um, that term go. It's found there. Now, this is, this, I, I know, this is kind of one of those technical things, but I, I just got to say it, all right? The word go that's found there, uh, that is not a command. 
Um, folks, that uh, a couple years ago, we had a Greek class here in our Bible Institute. Some of, you, some of you folks took it, did a great job. Deborah, you did wonderful in Greek class, by the way. Ex yeah, remember Greek class we had a couple years ago? You did great. Thank you. Amen. We had a couple others here. How many of you took the Greek class? Brother Stephen took the Greek class. I think Brother Carlos took the Greek class. I forget. It was a few of us here. We had a great time. And we learned, you know, a lot of technical things, certainly. And I'm not saying you have to learn Greek in order to understand your Bible. I'm not saying that at all. But I just want to let you know that this word here is not a commandment. It's not an imperative. That's the Greek, the Greek uh, verbs. And there are imperatives. And anytime you see an imperative, it's like saying, do this. This is not an imperative. It is a passive uh, preposition. Okay? So all you English majors out there, okay, you can just correct me later. Okay? But it's passive, okay, first of all, it's driven by something else, okay? But it's, it's, a, it's a participle. Um, it is a, um, um, let me see, I get my words right here. But it's a passive participle, okay? So, in, in other words, it's talking about, um, it, I guess, a good way of expressing this. Jesus is saying, I've got all authority. I've got all power. I've got, I, everything's been given to me, Jesus is saying. And since that, this is the passive part, since that is going on, while you're going, I want you to make disciples. We're never commanded to go. It's assumed that we will go. That's the assumption. So, I mean, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things are, you know, I mean, I've heard a lot of sermons about this command to go. It's not a command. It's, it's not a command. It's an assumption. And, and so, are you going based on the authority that Jesus has been given, that we have because we are in Christ and Christ is the head of the church and, and he has all of this authority and power, we are now going to take the gospel out. And the, the first word here about, is, you know, go and, and, uh, and teach all nations. That word teach has to do with making someone, through instruction, making someone a disciple. That's what the word is about. So that's the evangelistic part of it. So the idea is that you know, our, our, our outreach is based on instruction, giving the Word of God to people. It, it's not a matter of just getting people to pray prayers. It, it's not a matter of just convincing people that they you know, need to go to New Testament Baptist Church or whatever. The idea is to make disciples through instruction, getting the Word of God out to where people are at. That's the teaching part of it, instructing in the Word of God. So this is, this is part of the purpose of the church. And, and that is based on Christ's authority to advance the presentation of the gospel message so that people will become believers. And then, of course, followed up through baptism and then the continuance of instruction to you know, teach them to observe all things. And that's that discipleship part of it, the observation of the, of the rest of truth. And so this is, this is part of what we do here at New Testament Baptist Church. And so, um, you, um, of course, uh, if, if you would, uh, just over at Acts chapter 1, <coughs> excuse me, if you would please, it is assumed that we're going to go. And so, the, this going part, of course, um, you'll, you'll, you'll find, of course, in all the Gospels, but here in, in uh, Acts chapter 1, um, it says, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost, verses number 8, I beg your pardon, verse uh, uh, 1, 8. Uh, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. So here, here again, um, it's not necessarily a command, like, you better go out there and do this. It is this idea that once the Holy Spirit has empowered, now there is this assumption that because the Holy Spirit's at work, you are going to be a witness. So when the Holy Spirit's actually at work in a person's life, they are going to want to bear witness of the gospel. And, and please notice, of course, this, this great rep, you know, this repetition of, of direction here where he, where he says you're going to be witnesses both in Jerusalem, that's, of course, hometown, and Judea, that's the region around Samaria, that's the next, you know, outside of our comfort zone, the Jews did not like the Samaritans, so yes, that's outside the comfort zone. And then the uttermost part, that's the Gentiles, and that was way outside of their parameter, even their way of thinking. And so you see this expansion of it. So part of the purpose of the Lord's church 
is to, is, is to submit to our understanding of, of the power that rests in us through our reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. So we, our reliance upon his power and our reliance upon this empowerment that's given to us through the Holy Spirit. So not only does, does the authority rest in Jesus Christ, but the empowerment actually rests within the church and with us as individuals with the Holy Spirit in order to carry this out. So this is part of our purpose. And it's not just, the, it's not just here our purpose is to make sure that we're always going and doing and doing. Our purpose is to is to submit ourselves to this power and authority and empowerment and then respond to it through this work of evangelism. And so our purpose is to spread the gospel. Now, certainly I understand that not everybody is, um, is, is, well, uh, is well equipped to carry on long, lengthy evangelistic conversations with the lost. I understand that. But I also understand if you're a child of God, you've got a testimony. I mean, even, even the man, the blind man, he said, I, you know, I don't know what happened to me, but all I know is this man, Jesus, you know. Um, even the, the man from the, the Gadarenes, he's, Jesus said, just go and tell people what happened to you. Go back to your homes and tell people what happened. So even, even sharing our, our testimony of our faith with, with those that we know and love, that, that certainly fulfills this, um, um, this purpose. Um, when, when I think about the work of evangelism, it is, it's, it's so multitasks. It is, you know, certainly folks that are, um, you know, you think about it like a, like a ship or something. I mean, there, there's folks that are rowing and there's folks that are navigating and there's folks that are maintaining the boat and there's folks that are, you know, the, the fishers of men, you know, they're the ones out on the deck, you know, throwing the nets in or whatever. Uh, and so, I mean, it's like everybody has a part to play in that. Um, but, you know, the, the point of it is, is that the work continues on. As a body of believers, we all share in that in some way, shape, or form. We all take an active part in some way of making sure this is taking place. Um, but the going part, this is, this is one of those things that um, I, I, I talk about a lot. And, and um, matter of fact, uh, just, you know, as I mentioned the other day, I had the conversation with Brother Tony about this. And... Um, you know, the, the going part is, is so important. Um, um, the, um, the trend over these last several decades in churches is to, um, is to make the ministry more of a come than a go. That has been um, a trend that I've seen um, to the detriment of the work of the ministry. Now, what I mean by that is that the church, uh, the purpose of our church is not to attract the lost to come. And it's, you know, it is, a, it is a, it's certainly, it's a philosophy. I, I know that. Um, it's a way of approaching the ministry. Um, you know, dating back to the 80s with um, like Billy Heibel and his, you know, seeker service stuff, going back into the 90s with Rick Warren and his, um, you know, purpose-driven church philosophies. Uh, that stuff is still going on. To, I don't know who the latest author is. I, authors are nowadays with that. Um, I forget the term. I was just reading that a couple months ago. There's another term that was being floated around. That's exactly right. The emergent church, that type of philosophy. Um, and and the, the idea is, of course, is to make the, the ministry attractive to the lost. Well, how do you do that? Well, you unchurch the church because, you know, lost people are not going to be attracted to, you know, the traditional church trappings. You know, you got, you got old hymns that people just don't sing anymore or you use a Bible that has words in it that people just really don't understand um, you know, and so that's why so many churches have just stripped all that out. Um, that's why they have, you know, 45 minutes of praise and worship and music and the whole thing. The, the music sounds like the world's music. So they're, you know, they're more, they're more, they're more, they feel more compelled to be there because it just sounds like what they're used to. 
that's why the sermons are, are very uh, just kind of um, motivational. They have, uh, you know, a, I guess a moral sense to them. Um, seldom you'll hear, you'll hear, you know, harsh words like sin. And that, what has happened is, is that it's a change of philosophy. The philosophy is that we need to draw people to the church. You will never find that in the Word of God. That, that's not the purpose of our church, is to make us um, attractive to the lost so that they would come. Yes, sir? The Pharisees tried to do the same thing to Jesus' disciples. They said, hey, we pray, you pray, we fast, you fast, let's get together. He tried, and Jesus stopped him right in the spot. He said, no, they're not going with you. Yeah, and, uh, the, you know, the, it's a philosophy that the world um, um, will buy into. Um, now, what happens is, is that the church um, becomes so unchurched, there's not a lot of structure as far as the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Um, the lost are fed a gospel which is watered down. And if they do respond to it, what they're responding to is more of a... Um, they're not responding out of repentance. They're responding out of... Uh, out of um, it, it's, it, it, it's almost like a, 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 a mental uh, assertion, like, yeah, that's, that's what I want. Um, you're, you're talking about this peace that, you know, God loves me. He wants to give me peace in my life. I, I want this. And so they're, they're, what they're accepting is they're, they're accepting the, the, uh, this, this portrayed type of, of feeling of inclusion or a feeling of security instead of accepting the reality of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. And so this is a trend that's been going on for, you know, a couple decades now. I mean, I saw it back in the 80s with, uh, with all the Billy Heibel stuff. I mean, I was, you know, I was a young Christian, and, you know, I, I heard these things. And, it, you, know, uh, I, I, you know, the church I was in didn't buy into it. Uh, certainly when I got to Berean uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, they didn't buy into it. Um, and but we saw it happening all over. Um, the of course, I went out to school to go to Baptist Bible College as part of the Baptist Bible College. Uh, uh, BB, uh, BBC is part of the Baptist Bible Fellowship International (BBFI), which is a you know it's not a denomination; it's a fellowship of churches. But so many of those churches bought into that philosophy and tore that fellowship apart. They split, the Heartland Group started, BBC still continue on. A lot of their churches are now dropping Baptist off the thing because you offend people when you call yourself a Baptist, apparently. And so now they're you know, becoming you know, some kind of no-name denominational type of thing. And the reason they're doing that is a philosophy, and that is to make themselves more attractive to the lost. That is not the purpose of the church. <laughs> That's not what we do. Now, it, take your Bibles. Go with me to, um, I was just looking at this verse early this morning. And uh, let me see here. I don't even know if I got it in my notes. Probably not. It's uh, Luke, um, what is that, Luke 16, I think it is. It's uh, one of the parables. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I got to find it now. Let's see. I, I don't. I didn't write it in my notes here. I hate it when I do that. Did I write? No, that's not. It's not that one. Actually, it's the. It's the verse of scripture uh, where uh, there were uh, Christ is teaching parables. Oh, there. It's in Luke chapter uh, fourteen. If you would please, Luke chapter fourteen. I was just reading this um, this morning, right before I left the house, so I didn't get a chance even to write it down in my notes here. This is the uh, the. Um, the verse of script, the portion of scripture, of Christ is teaching a bunch of parables of the kingdom. He starts in verse number 15 when it says, And one of them that sat at meat with him, this is Luke 14, 15, heard these things and said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man had a great supper and bade many. And of course, this is a parable, and it's a parable about the kingdom. 
And, um, and, and I, 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 wanted, I want you to look at verse number 23. Because so much philosophy of the ministry is driven by verse number 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Okay, Great verse of scripture. Okay, um, Let's talk about some bad hermeneutics. Okay. All right, let's go back, um, let's go back uh, um, uh, 1,500 years, all right? Um, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Augustine of Hippo, uh, Roman Catholic. This is, this is pre-Roman Catholic. The Catholic Church is just getting started. Uh, um, Augustine is, is, is a philosopher, theologian, and he really wrote the book on a lot of Catholic doctrine. The underlying foundations of what a lot of Catholicism is today is a product of, of uh, Augustine of Hippo. Hippo is a city, actually, it's not a hippopotamus, uh, in, in northern Africa. Okay? And so he looks at this hippopotamuses, yes, because you want one for Christmas, don't you? That's her, oh, you want her, okay. So um, let's not sing that song. The Philosophy that he had, based on this verse of scripture, is a compulsion of making people into Christians. So what what what, Hip, what Hippo said, yeah, what Augustine says, and this is this was the driving force of Roman Catholicism all throughout the Dark Ages, and that is compulsion to become a believer. So the Roman Catholic Church would not hesitate to go into a town and say to them, you're all going to convert to Catholicism. And they're going to say, no, we don't want to do that. And they pull out the sword and they say, yes, you will, or I'm going to kill you. And you think, that's wrong. Well, based on the philosophy on that verse of Scripture that the Roman Catholic Church had for a thousand plus years, it's exactly what they did, and they justified it in the Word of God. That's bad hermeneutics, okay? And so this idea of compulsion, go and compel people to come, was, uh, was really misinterpreted. And, and the Roman Catholic Church, they, they built their empire. They believe that they're the physical kingdom of God on earth, and that's a whole different other area of bad hermeneutics. But, um, they, they, and they advanced their kingdom by, by force, based on that verse, that one verse of Scripture. So you look at that and you say, well, that's not what it's talking about. Well, what is it talking about? Well, even today, there's a lot of philosophy about evangelism, even amongst Baptists that look at that verse of Scripture and say, well, we're, we're supposed to go out there and convince people to, to get saved, to come to church, compel them to come in. So what are they going to do? I mean, that's a driving force behind a lot of ministries. Well, we're going to, you know, we're going to load up, you know, 50 buses with 1,000 kids and we're going to bus them in because we're going to compel them to come in. I'm not saying there's anything wrong about having bus ministries. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is, is that a lot of bad philosophy about the ministry is based on that verse of Scripture. That's compulsion. And that's why a lot of people have that, that, uh, that hyper-evangelistic thing where they want to get into people's faces and say, you need to trust Jesus and this is what you need to do and here it is. And you've got to pray this prayer. And what we're doing is we're compelling them to come in. Well, that, that is not what that verse is about at all. That verse is actually not about evangelism and the least. It's an observation of the kingdom of God. It's, it's, a, it's a statement concerning the fact that the Jews have been presented with the gospel and they've made excuses not to go. So the, with, the, with the idea is now that the gospel is not being accepted by the Jews, then we're going to go out to the rest of the world. And we're going to present it to them and give them the opportunity or the invitation to come and, and be a part of the kingdom of God. It has nothing to do with the church and has nothing to do with evangelism. It has to do with the kingdom of God. And it has to do with the shift away from the Jews to the Gentile world. That's what that whole passage is about. It's a, it's a, it's a kingdom parable. And it's amazing how so many folks have taken one, they've extracted one verse of scripture out of the middle of this whole entire parable and they built an entire philosophy around it. Uh, you know, especially when you, you're thinking about how many people died as a result 
of that verse of Scripture. How many people died at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church because of the misinterpretation of one verse of Scripture? It's horrible when you consider it. You know what's even worse is horrible? It is when somebody takes and has this idea of compulsion and, and puts a false gospel out there of just getting people to pray prayers so they can you know, say, well, I got X amount of people saved this past Sunday. How many of you have saved this Sunday? Let me ask you this. Who gets the glory for that? Is that God or man? God will not share his glory with another. And I, I think if any church shifts their philosophy of, of this compulsion of getting people saved, then, uh, you know, God's not going to get glory in that. He'd take his hands right off and said, fine, you just do what you want to do. Whenever you're done playing your games, then we can talk. It is a misinterpretation of Scripture to think that we have to compel people to get saved. We do not compel people to get saved. We don't bribe them. We don't trick them. What we do is we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Some of us plant, some of us water, and God gives the increase. That's, that's the glory of God. It's not found anywhere else. All right, we're on overtime. i got to stop. All right, thank you for being in Sunday school this morning.